independent research, work with the business community on strategies and best practices, and advocate for policy solutions at the state, federal, and international levels. This is the second in our series of webinars on this topic, and I'll provide the dates for future webinars at the end of our presentation today. So for today's agenda, I'm going to quickly describe some high-level findings from our Weathering the Storm report, and then turn it over to my colleague, Joe Casola to describe specific steps that companies and other organizations are taking to evaluate and manage climate change impacts. Joe is our staff scientist and program director for climate science and impacts. We'll leave some time for questions as well. To ask a question, just please type it into the questions box in your webinar control panel. So during the presentation, everyone will be placed on mute, and we'll get to uh, questions at the end. I'll moderate the questions at the end. And this webinar is being recorded. So from T2ES perspective, we're undertaking research on this issue, on climate impacts and business resilience, because we're already seeing the effects and costs of climate change. And these are just a few of the examples we've already seen across the past year of the, um, of the damages that, that extreme weather and climate change are already occurring. So with support from Bank of America, C2ES looked in depth at the state of resilience planning among a cross-section of global companies. We found that the recent increase in costly extreme weather events has provided a clear signal to many companies of the near-term risks associated with climate change, and that climate impacts are already beginning to damage facilities or interrupt power and water supplies, drive up insurance costs, or disrupt supply and distribution chains. The company said that it was still very difficult to determine how and when to change practices or to make capital investments. They described challenges with how to identify and quantify risks, especially given the lack of detailed enough information and tools that help companies apply these risks to the business context. So most companies are managing climate risks through existing business continuity or, or enterprise risk management plans. And while those tools are certainly appropriate places to start, they do need to be adjusted to incorporate an evolving and changing profile of extreme weather and climate risk. And so only a few companies say they had used forward-looking climate-specific forecasting tools to more comprehensively assess how those risks are evolving over time. And so while, while companies said that they needed better projections and models of climate change to make, decision make, to, make, to make decisions, they need more investment in public infrastructure. They need, in regulated sectors, they need policies that would encourage spending and better customer decisions about risk mitigation. And C2ES also recommends in our report a voluntary public-private partnership to develop and improve resilience planning and capacity. And so while we can't be sure about all the ways that climate change will manifest over the coming years, smart companies are already recognizing that waiting to act can be a costly response. And a few leading groups are taking additional steps to build greater resilience to those risks where there's a clear business case to do so, where they see opportunities to become more efficient, to reduce costs, or to provide greater value to customers. So I'll turn it over now to Joe to describe some of the specific action steps that uh, companies and other organizations are taking to better assess and evaluate and manage some of these risks. So Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Meg. Uh, and this, this uh, talk is going to be a little bit um, oblique to some of the things in the report. Uh, I'm going to spend some time. Uh, kind of detailing, or I should say the goal, is to really detail some of that four-step process in more depth and, and how an organization, whether it be a, a company or even a, a city or, or a regional planning organization, might go through taking steps to build their resilience. So, Meg, if you can go to the next slide. So, I've broken the, the, the talk into three parts. First, just a 30,000-foot view of what climate science tells us about climate change. Second, what types of impacts do we expect and how does that intersect, how do those impacts intersect with things that we care about and things that we plan for uh, across lots of organizations? And then third, kind of detailing this four-step process, how do we actually address impacts uh, within an organization? Next slide, please. Okay, this big picture. The big picture, I, I think there's a lot of things that, that get circulated in the media that, that even I find sometimes confusing about what, what climate science says about climate change. And 
uh, a lot of times I think that the media articles are, are tied up in, in current research and what, what scientists are, are publishing on or, or potentially arguing about at conferences right now. Uh, the reality is there's, I think, an underlying uh, set of facts that we've uh, established over, in some cases, over a century of science, in other cases, more like the last 15 and 20 years. This enumerated list, I think, goes through them and, and kind of establishes humans' role in climate change. Uh, first is that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases make the planet warmer. Second, carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere. Third is we've observed the Earth actually warming. Fourth, that this warming sticks out and that we attribute the warming to humans' emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. And lastly, that given our trajectory with emissions, we should expect future warming. And if we stay on the same trajectory, that future warming could be very large. So I'm going to talk to these very, very quickly. Next slide, please. So first, greenhouse gases warming the planet. This is just simply a, a little primer on the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases work like a blanket. They uh, prevent outgoing radiation, which are the red squiggles in this slide. They prevent that radiation from escaping uh, from the planet, and in doing so, keep things a little bit warmer. And, and we know that we've known about this for over a century, and it naturally keeps the Earth a lot more comfortable uh, than it would be without an atmosphere. Next slide, please. So the CO2 is accumulating in the atmosphere, and now our concentration of CO2 is uh, higher than at least the last 800,000 years, and uh, there's some suggestions that it may be in the last few million years. So we've really um, changed the chemical composition of the atmosphere drastically. This graph shows the uh, observations that NOAA has been maintaining uh, since the mid-50s that, that serve as a uh, global record of the, the carbon dioxide that's well mixed in our atmosphere. Next slide, please. Okay, the Earth is actually warming, and this graph is the average uh, temperature of the planet um, from the late 19th century when our, our instrumental records began. And since uh, around the turn of the century, uh, we've uh, warmed up almost a degree and a half Fahrenheit. Uh, and the recent decades, we've had many of the warmest years ever recorded. Uh, in addition to this temperature record, which I think is kind of the, the, the first tier, kind of the best single metric that we have for, for climate change, we have other indicators that, that also suggest that uh, we are uh, making the planet warmer. So Meg, next slide, please. So this slide shows some of these indicators that are consistent with a global uh, scale warming uh, from oceans, from the cryosphere, and from ecosystems. So in the upper right hand corner, that's uh, that shed picture, and the PVC tubing is actually a tide gauge. Uh, and that has shown that we've had a lot of sea level rise in the last century. Uh, and a lot of, although in localities there can be a lot of factors for sea level rise, when you average around the world, uh, the global sea level rise is very much consistent with a, an ocean that's getting warmer and with more ice being melted into it. The bottom right corner is actually that ice, and, and we've seen ice change in two ways that, that's consistent with warming. Um, first, that uh, the big ice sheets that sit on land in Greenland and Antarctica and glaciers around the world, many of them are melting, and, and the uh, rate of melting has really increased in many of these locations. The second ice indicator is, uh, is Arctic sea ice, that we've been losing a lot of that Arctic sea ice in the summertime, and uh, we feel that, that that's another indicator that the whole planet is warming up. The third indicator I have here are just changes in ecosystems, and this little schematic shows uh, changes in forest habitats uh, along a mountainside, uh, that basically you have different types of, of trees kind of retreating up the higher altitudes where it would be cooler. And this is something that we see a lot, and we see it not just along mountainsides, but we also see it in latitudes, that you see different types of species, whether it be trees or insects or uh, uh, maybe uh, birds uh, or, ma other or mammals, that they're moving north uh, where they're trying to get to, to areas that were historically colder, uh, but now that's kind of where their habitat is shifting. Next slide, please. Okay, the, the number four uh, bullet, that the warming that we've experienced is unusual and it's best explained by our emissions. This is one where a lot of our 
previously, I think there's been a lot more debate, but our, our confidence in this attribution argument has grown. Um, first, the, the rate of the warming and the magnitude of the warming, it's, it's extremely large. It really sticks out when we think about um, some of the proxies for the last hundred years. And even in a longer time scale, when you think about thousands of years, uh, the differences in, between an ice age and a, a, an interglacial a warm period in the last several hundred thousand years was only about 5 degrees Celsius, and that's 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And the planet's already warmed uh, a degree and a half in just the last hundred years. So that, that rate is really kind of astounding in the long view. In addition, the pattern of warming, both uh, uh, kind of being around the world uh, and also with height vertically that we get a, a warming um, through the, the depth of the atmosphere really matches what we expect kind of from a physics basis, what greenhouse gases should do compared to other forcings like the sun or like changes in the ocean. And those other forcings have largely been ruled out. Lastly, our simulation tools, our, our climate models, can really only replicate the last century's warming uh, when we include greenhouse gases. So all these kind of lines of evidence uh, help us help us feel confident about that attribution argument. Next slide, please. And this is just kind of an aside from that five uh, point um, uh, rundown of the, uh, the broad view of climate science that we know this from a lot of assessment literature. And that assessment literature, like the IPCC, which is uh, producing its, its next periodic assessment on Friday, or at least releasing it, uh, it's already been produced, um, really draws on the work of thousands of studies. And the authors involved in, in kind of establishing these four and five points have a, are, are really from a, a diverse set of backgrounds, both from diff different disciplines, uh, a large number of countries. And the, the, the process that they go through to get, pro, to get papers done, uh, written and to form these assessments is often highly adversarial. And you kind of see this little uh, far sideish cartoon of a scientist trying to get their paper accepted, but they have to go through this gauntlet of other scientists who are looking to, uh, to criticize them or to tell them that that work's already been done or to try to challenge them to, uh, to look at things in new ways. And, I think this process really is important because it's not one that, that normally produces kind of consensus. It's not a group think activity. It, it really is about uh, being, in a way, skeptical along the way. Um, and despite that kind of inherently built-in process and the number of people involved and the number of, uh, or the, and the diversity of their backgrounds, those five points have really kind of come shining through. And the, uh, the reports in the bottom right-hand corner are just some of the places where you can see where this, these messages have been affirmed. The one on the left is the National Research Council report from 2010. Uh, the middle one is an interagency report uh, from 2009, uh, the National Climate Assessment, which will be updated uh, this upcoming spring. And the far most uh, one on the right is the new IPCC, which even though we don't have the text for it publicly done and available, we do have a cover that we, we know about. So that's kind of an aside to those five points. Meg, next slide, please. And this is the, the fifth point, that, that we think the uh, warming in the 21st century, if we continue on our emissions trajectory, will be much larger than what we've seen in the 20th century. So in this graph on the left, we have the observations in black and gray of what global temperature has done. And on the right is where we think things are going. And this is from the last IPCC report from the 2007 report. But the emissions trajectory that we've been closest to is actually that red line. Uh, so you see quite a bit of warming uh, on the order of 3 degrees, 3.5 degrees Celsius. Um, the green and blue curves would correspond to pretty significant reductions in the emissions trajectories. And even those uh, show uh, anywhere from just under 2 degrees Celsius to almost 3 degrees Celsius. And it's important to note that these aren't really forecasts. These aren't really predictions. These are plausible pathways that if the world kind of unfolds population-wise and technology-wise in a certain way, that these are, are the emissions. There is a certain set of emissions that go along with that. And uh, this is, these are just kind of their temperatures that, that go along with that. So they're not really saying that this, this is uh, one is more likely than another or that, that this is the road we are definitely on. What's interesting is that 
for the next several decades and for what a lot of planning uh, that organizations really care about right now. The different scenarios don't matter very much. The spread among them is very small. It's not until really after 2050 that, that they really begin to, uh, to diverge. And I think this is important when thinking about uncertainty, that in some cases our uncertainty for the next few decades is actually not as large as it is for the end of the century. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was the quick review of, uh, of climate science. Uh, now we'll get into well, why, why, do, why should we care about these things? Why should we care about one degree Celsius or two degrees Celsius or um, these kind of uh, wiggly curves about carbon dioxide in Hawaii? Next slide, please. So the reason these things uh, matter is because at, at more local scales, at the national scale, the city scale, and even all the way down to some facility scale issues, we have to deal with, with new climate conditions that may not uh, be uh, suitable for the way we have assets and services lined up. So one example of this is uh, more frequent heat waves and more severe heat waves. And these graphs show in different regions uh, in the country where we think the freak, where the number of days that might be over 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in these different spots. And if you see these, they're pretty small, but on the left, the uh, brownish bar is what we've seen uh, at the end of the 20th century, is what we've experienced. And the orange and red are what we uh, might see in the future for some of those emissions pathways. And each one is a different time period. So the first time period is kind of the early 21st century. The next is, uh, I believe, in the 2060s, 2070s. And then the, um, the last one is the end of the 21st century. But you can see that really substantial increases in every region. And for that high emission scenario at the end of the 21st century, some some really dramatic increases, uh, especially in places like the middle of the country and the southwest. Next slide, please. Another uh, area where impacts, I think, pose a challenge for, for, uh, for companies and uh, for a lot of infrastructure is sea level rise. And this is from NOAA, and this is a summary of what the tide gauges around the country have seen uh, with past sea level rise. And the length of these records vary. Some of them are um, 50 years long. Some of them are as long as 100 years. But they're all a minimum of 30 years. And they've been converted just into a rate of sea level rise. So some of the green and yellow arrows are um, several inches per century. Um, the global number actually is about eight inches in the last century. So some of those greens and yellows are, are um, a little bit less than what we've seen globally. Um, Whereas the oranges and reds tend to be uh, the uh, um, more, I'm sorry, they're, they're not inches per century. They're, uh, they're feet per century. Um, I apologize. So the greens and, and the, since we've seen about eight inches, the, the green corresponds to the global uh, average, whereas the yellows, oranges, and reds are much, much larger than what we've seen globally average. And the reason for these differences is now, a lot of things affect sea level rise at the local scale. You can have land that's actually sinking. Uh, you can have uh, different atmospheric conditions or ocean conditions, which can often last for several decades, kind of pushing water up. Um, so you can have a lot of kind of local factors that affect uh, the rates. Uh, however, what we think of for the future are all much, much larger than these. I think it's important to realize that this is uh, the baseline of where we, we think uh, future sea level rise might be going. Next slide, please. We'll show the difference in that in this slide, actually. So this is, rather than a regional picture, rather than a map, this is the global average. And you can see this middle portion where you see the greens and reds. That's what we've observed happening uh, about eight inches if you convert this millimeter scale to, to the imperial units. But the future. We have anywhere from uh, maybe a foot or so of sea level rise, which is uh, represented by that magenta region, to several feet of sea level rise, which is the gray region. There's large uncertainty in this. Part of that's tied into uh, you know, that spread in the temperatures that we don't know what future emissions look like. Uh, however, part of this is also tied into our uncertainty in understanding how those ice sheets respond. That's been a, an area of really active research for the past uh, uh, 
six or seven years, and I think an area that, that still is going to demand more more research to try to figure out how those those ice sheets do respond to uh, to warming. So far, we've been consistently surprised. I will say that uh, the assumptions about how fast ice sheets have have melted have often been underestimates, and that the reality of uh, of melting has usually been greater than uh, than previous expectations. Next slide, please. Another um, area where we have pretty high confidence in the relationship between climate change and impacts is with wildfire. And this is in the, uh, this map shows the, the western U.S. And the increase in the um, area of, of uh, wildfire uh, for just one degree Celsius, about two degrees Fahrenheit of more warming. And these numbers are huge, uh, if you notice that the smallest numbers you find are 75 percent. And in other places, you're talking about you know, multiplier effects to what we've seen previously. So there's a lot of different factors that affect whether or not a fire occurs, but I think the effect of warming uh, adds kind of an extra accelerant uh, that, it, that it can make fires burn uh, to a greater extent, uh, greater area than they may have in the past. I mean, we've obviously seen in the last few years some really um, horrendous and damaging fires. Next slide, please. The relationship between uh, climate change and rainfall is often uh, more complicated, especially if you get at the, lo at the local scales. So the graph on the, the maps on the left show the amount change in the percentage change in overall seasonal rainfall uh, for the, 20, the end of the 21st century, given one of those high emissions trajectories. So similar to what we saw in that red, the, the temperatures associated with that red line before. This would be the precipitation that, that accompanies that. And you can see that generally the northern parts of the continent get wetter, uh, especially in the winter and the spring. And the southern part of the continent tends to be getting drier. The problem is that different models give you a different dividing line of where that, that wet versus dry change might be. So it becomes very difficult to say, well, actually, uh, in Washington, D.C. or in San Francisco, we expect it to get wetter or drier. There's a lot of uncertainty. But this general pattern that the higher latitudes get wetter and the kind of subtropics expand is something that we do see robustly, even though it becomes hard locally to, uh, to make statements about that. Um, one issue with the precipitation that we have seen that is more robust is that some of the heavy, heavy dumps, the heavy rainfall events, uh, have more rain uh, coming out of them and that they're happening more more frequently. So these maps are just the multiplier on the 1 in 20 year heavy rainfall event, uh, just looking at amount of rainfall falling in 24 hours. So on the left is a very low emissions pathway. It's actually lower than the ones that, that were shown uh, on the, the initial graph earlier. So even for a kind of a a low level of warming, that emissions uh, pathway might actually keep us below 2 degrees Celsius warming, globally speaking. Um, you would still have a kind of a mild increase. It's a very pale shade of blue. Uh, but on the right, for that, that high emission scenario, you see multipliers um, you know, greater than 2 for most of the country at the highest latitudes up in the 5, 6, and 7. So that would essentially be turning a 1 in 20 year event to more like the 1 in four-year event, uh, so the really, really increase in the frequency of some of the heaviest, uh, heaviest downpours. Next slide, please. So all of this stuff that I laid out may, may again, not immediately say, oh, well, that affects me, but I think that, that all the business folks uh, and, and all the resource managers out there, all the infrastructure managers, uh, can tell stories about how heavy rainfall, heat waves, uh, storm surge, uh, flooding along the coast, all these types of um, physical effects that I just went through have affected them. And it could be in the transportation sector, with energy supply, public health, uh, agricultural production, uh, availability and quality of water resources and ecosystems. And I've just shown a few different pictures. Um, this oil rig picture, uh, it, it, oil rigs are obviously affected uh, by sea level rise, that, that they're, and they're engineered with an assumption for a certain kind of sea height, and if that changes, there can be real threats, uh, especially during heavy storms. 
the picture to the right is actually uh, a photo, uh, an aerial photo of Chicago, and that little ball field in the middle is actually Wrigley Field. And this is some work that the city of Chicago has done to pursue their uh, um, their adaptation work to look at, at heat islands. And they've actually sh shown that, that some of the hottest parts of the city are right around this area and have become kind of a, uh, a focal point um, where they mapped out these red spots. The mosquito, uh, I think, is another, I, I should say that has real health issues, and the mosquito is another one that poses public health challenges, that you have the expansion of a lot of uh, disease vectors like mosquitoes to new areas where they may not have been before. Ticks are another one that, that we've often seen migrating to far, farther northern latitudes. The uh, bottom picture, um, I can't remember now if that's uh, Lake Powell or, or Lake Mead, but uh, one of them actually showing us that the lake levels are recently low. And, and here's an area where you know we have sustainability issues already with the balance between the consumption of water and the, the supply. And some of the, the changes in the hydrologic cycle, whether it be with rainfall or with snowpack, which I didn't discuss too, too specifically, can really affect the timing of, uh, of stream flow and the supplies. Uh, and lastly, this is one that, that we've seen uh, a lot. This is a map of the Gulf Coast showing a lot of the transportation infrastructure that's really critical to not only uh, national uh, kind of transport of goods and people, but a lot of the energy uh, fuels uh, and supply. Um, a lot of that infrastructure, that transportation infrastructure, is very low lying. It's already uh, vulnerable to um, storm surge and uh, inundation and future sea level rise uh, does not bode well to that region. So just kind of a few examples of how all these physical changes in the climate system can manifest themselves with resources and infrastructure that we, we uh, are more used to, I think, managing. Next slide, please. OK, now getting to the part three, the actual planning, what to do about, about these impacts. Next slide, please. So the, the name of the game, and obviously it's the title of the report, is, is resilience. And, and it's trying to create systems or trying to, to uh, enhance the resilience of systems so that they can anticipate, absorb, adapt to, and are rapidly recover from disruptive events. We're not necessarily going to stop these events from happening. Uh, then, and we know that even if we do take some drastic action on emissions, the next few decades, uh, we are still going to be dealing with a lot of extreme weather events and, and some amount of climate change. So how do we pursue this? And we lay this four-step process out in the report. The first step is to raise awareness uh, within your organization. The second, to identify and assess vulnerability. The third, to actually uh, pursue some options to manage risks. And fourth is to evaluate and reassess the, the choices that you've made to, to uh, determine if that's path to continue on or if new information uh, might suggest alternate uh, routes. And I'm going to walk through each of these four points uh, for the next few slides. Next slide, please. OK, raising awareness. And I think this is a really important uh, starting point for, for pursuing uh, resilience. It's to really get a conversation going among staff, among upper management, among people who report to you uh, throughout your supply chain and your vendors about extreme weather and climate change. And it doesn't, there are ways that, that you can sometimes avoid some of the political hurdles uh, that, that you get associated with those words. Uh, the big questions you want to, I think, get and, and that you want to raise awareness about is how are the systems that you care about being affected by extreme weather and, and how is it affected maybe by longer term things in climate like droughts or maybe um, uh, El Nino events that might last for a long time and, and create certain types of weather in your region. And some of these uh, the ways to get to that, because those questions can be intimidating for people, or they may just feel they don't have much to offer. Um, the reality is that a lot of a lot of folks who are close to managing resources and managing a business uh, do actually have valuable experiential knowledge. Um, just identifying what types of things they do worry about, what keeps them up at night. Uh, what types of parts of their system tend to, to fail or break or malfunction, um, what types of years have been bad for them, and what types of events have kind of pushed them past their level of tolerance, um, how much the costs have been in the past, and how much things um, 
uh, might cost if you had kind of a really bad event. Uh, you know, if you, you uh, think about Sandy or another Sandy for people who are, are working in the Northeast. And also think about who gets stuck with the bills. You know, where is it in the organization that this risk kind of uh, uh, ends up sitting? All these ways, I think, these are very normal, um, I think, business risk management questions that can help you start a conversation that, that touches on extreme weather and climate risk. Next slide, please. So the, the second step is to assess your vulnerability. And I, I really want to, this I think is in some ways, to me, one of the most important steps because you're making the conversation that, that you may have started in a more casual format, more systematic. But secondly, it changes the nature of the challenge of planning for climate change from the top down to the bottom up. And I, I don't have this really on the slide, so I'm just kind of talking through this. A lot of times I think uh, organizations concerned about climate change start with, I need to know what the future climate looks like. And I think that's, that's a very difficult question. As I've shown before, there's a lot of uncertainty, especially as you go out further in time. A lot of that, that knowledge uh, for the future may not correspond to what our normal planning horizons are. So I think the best way to try to, to, to assess vulnerability and to try to make this conversation systematic is to invert the problem. Rather than think about, oh, I need to know what the future climate looks like, it's what are the assets and resources and services that, that are really in trouble, that are exposed, that are sensitive, and that are vulnerable. And so this systematic conversation can be um, done through a survey. New York City actually is often pointed to as a leader in this area. Uh, began their work with really a, a huge survey effort across uh, all of its departments, essentially the wastewater people, transportation, electric, utility, um, you name it, they, they passed out a set of forms, and that's how they really got things going. Um, that's a relatively informal. If you have a smaller organization or a smaller group that you're working with, it could be a workshop. Um, those are informal ways to get things started. Uh, more um, involved ways could be through uh, like a case study or kind of collecting information about a particular events. Uh, it could be through looking at data uh, that's available. A lot of um, agencies have quite sophisticated asset management or labor tracking. Um, software or databases that can be tapped to compare to weather information and climate information to say to, to really analyze in a quantitative way how assets or services or labor costs may have been affected uh, by weather and climate. And I think more of the Cadillac version is really when you get into coupled modeling. If you're really pulling in some high test scientific tools uh, about the future climate and marrying that to uh, models or simulation things that you have for your own business exercises. Uh, I don't want to advocate that these one is better than another, but that this is an iterative approach. You can start with the informal one and work your way over the course of years to more formal quantitative ones. Uh, again, the New York example, um, that's exactly kind of where they've gone. Um, the goal, regardless of whether you have kind of an informal process or, or you're working with more uh, detailed um, platforms, is to really get to your get a list, get a list of whether it be types of events or locations in your system or a set of assets or a set of services that are concerned. And and essentially, what you're looking for is almost like a narrative. It's a story about how the things in your organization uh, have been affected by climate change or could be affected by climate change uh, and, and extreme weather events kind of wrapped into that. Next slide, please. I want to emphasize, and this is, I think, another, uh, another con uh, consideration associated with this more bottom-up approach in assessing vulnerability, is oftentimes you end up in discussions about non-climate information. And I think this is actually a good thing because a lot of times that non-climate information may be uh, easier for people to, uh, to get a handle on. Um, some examples, land use information affects almost all impacts. So we saw in the Chicago um, example that the areas that they were going to focus on weren't predictions of future warming within the city. It was based on their knowledge of basically where the airflow is bad, where there's a lot of concrete, where they have these heat islands. Uh, so impervious surfaces work in the same way. 
Uh, where we have flood protection, especially along the coast, is a really, really big deal. So how we've used land, how we've used land, our land use decisions, really has a big impact on our vulnerability. Thinking in the future mode, population growth changes in the, the demographics of folks, whether you might be getting a lot of elderly folks or, or kind of the socioeconomic status of the folks you have that are in your communities that you're working in, that can have a big uh, impact on vulnerability. Another issue, and this is something that's in the CQES report quite a bit, is how other systems vulnerabilities can impact the business. You may be subject to uh, the supply of electricity, the supply of water, the availability of transportation. These are systems you may not manage directly, but you definitely feel when impacts occur to those. And lastly, disaster events and, and how we respond to those events can affect our vulnerability, that our vulnerability is not static in time. And that's what this picture shows. Um, it may be a little hard to pick out. This is the Jersey Shore, and this was a survey that the USGS did prior to Sandy. And they, they assessed three different types of impacts from strong storms. Um, collision of waves with the dunes, uh, overtopping, where waves would actually come over the dunes, and inundation. So actually, not only the waves come over the dunes, but there's flooding behind the dunes. So there's three ribbons of color. And where it's red, that's basically a really high chance of that happening. Um, so that's the inner ribbon. And you can see all up and down the coast, strong storm, you have collisions with dunes, kind of makes sense. Then for the overtopping, you see a little bit more of white creep in in this middle ribbon of color, uh, where areas maybe the dunes are a little farther back, or maybe they're at slightly higher. It's a slightly steeper elevated grade near the coast. And then the, the outermost ribbon is where inundation occurs. So you'd have the lighter places being kind of more protected, the red places being areas where you would expect there to be flooding. It may be areas where there are actually breaks in the barrier or island or inlet. And this was actually quite useful. Uh, this surveying actually turned out to be a very good predictor of where some of the worst impacts were uh, when combined with knowledge of where some of the strongest winds were and strongest storm surge. However, that being said, this map has to be redone. Almost all of the beach has been rearranged. And so the vulnerability of the Jersey Shore no longer looks like this. So even though this was a useful tool for understanding vulnerability, uh, the uh, disaster event itself has now altered the vulnerability of this, this system. Next slide, please. OK, now we get to actually managing risk. So from the previous step, ideally, you have some sort of short list, or it could be a relatively long list, of uh, vulnerabilities. Now we kind of convert those vulnerabilities into risks. And, and normally the way that risks have been thought of, there's a lot of ways to define risk um, depending on which disciplinary community you are closely aligned with. Um, but one of the kind of classical ways is just thinking about the likelihood of an impact and how the, what the consequences are, what is the, how bad could it be. And if you can come up with a way of assessing those two things, it can work as a prioritization uh, of that short list of, uh, of impacts. And again, I, I to emphasize kind of an earlier point that we don't need to, through this risk management framework, we don't necessarily need to predict an actual event will happen, when it will happen, how bad it will be. We're basically making it, uh, we're using the uncertainty as an input. We're trying to gather what uh, an expert or a manager's opinion about that uncertainty uh, might be. And we do these types of things all the time. I mean, we do this against uh, economic markets. We do this uh, against all other types of natural disasters like earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, that we really have very, very poor predictability for. So putting climate into this context is actually, uh, I think, quite appropriate. And we do have some predictive information. It may be uncertain, but we, we're not working with nothing. So this graph down below, this matrix is actually, this appears in one of the National Academy's reports from 2010 about adaptation. And it was uh, cribbed from the New York City approach. Uh, but you see this in a lot of other planning contexts. Folks in Washington State uh, have used this for the Department of Transportation. Um, and I, I know that the US DOT has been using this in workshops as well. But you can get folks together who, who manage uh, infrastructure. You can get bring in also climate experts and, and try to rate these risks. And if you can locate the risks in these, uh, in these kind of boxes, uh, you can then determine, well, is this the type of risk we need to take action on immediately? Or is it something we need to kind of uh, keep our eye on and, and think about in more of a contingency plan, uh, something to check in on? 
Next slide, please. With that prioritization, for things that do require strategies or, or that may be on kind of the watch list, there's a lot of options. It could be uh, hardening or protecting an asset or service that, that's vulnerable. It could be relocating or abandoning or, or even having a plan to abandon such that when something bad happens in the near future, the, the asset or service is not rebuilt in the same place. I'd mentioned monitoring. Um, that, that really just setting up a system where you can see things changing uh, can be really valuable. Sometimes we just don't have good information collection uh, about sensitive or vulnerable assets or services. Um, trying to share a spread risk through the use often of insurance. That's another way of, uh, uh, of managing uh, risk. And diversifying or expanding redundancy. For example, if you have one supply route into a key area, perhaps you, you have you add multiple supply routes, or you find uh, alternate facilities and make arrangements to, to get a key product or, or a supply of a key resource uh, from other areas. And Megan, if you could hit the next slide. Within this managing of risk, this is where I think a lot of the classical business decisions come in. Now you can bring in all sorts of information about cost, about timing, about the flexibility of an option. Does it foreclose other options in the future, or does it still allow you to choose different pathways should new information come about? Are there co-benefits to any of these um, op options that might help you with other management issues? Maybe it helps you with water quality. Maybe it helps you with your greenhouse gas emissions targets. It could ha have a lot of different uh, other ulterior management goals. And so, um, Working from the bottom up, now we've, I think, added in, you can add in that layer of, of I think, uh, what would be in a normal prioritization of, of selecting a particular strategy. Next slide, please. Another uh, point of emphasis that I think affects all the different steps in the four-step process is trying to leverage available resources. A lot of states, cities, counties, uh, even kind of multi-state areas, um, have conducted vulnerability assessments, and I've shown a few pictures here, South Florida, Washington State, the D.C. region. Um, federal agencies and local universities often have tons of technical expertise, and they are, in some cases, being very effective, in other cases, really just starting to get things off the ground. But they're really looking for ways to, I think, show that they're useful and show that they're being used by decision makers, uh, whether they be natural resource folks uh, associated with the public sector or private sector decision makers. I've shown a few of those here, USGS, the Weather Service, and NOAA. There are a lot of shared vulnerabilities that exist. So cities may be taking action on vulnerable, vulnerable infrastructure or may want to take action that also affects your business. And finding ways to, to uh, unite those conversations, I think, can really save resources in the long run and come out with better solutions. Next slide, please. Another kind of cross-cutting point is that uh, I think the organizations that have done well with this climate risk challenge are integrating it into their normal risk management activities and making kind of the crisis or preparation for a crisis part of the everyday. Uh, and there are lots of opportunities where this kind of overlaps with, with kind of normal decisions. It could be in managing supply chains, facilities, workforce. Um, and there are a lot of tools out there that, that I think can be really useful, uh, such as scenario planning, um, insurance, as I mentioned before, and, and these two uh, pictures uh, to the right, the shakeout and the arc storm. Those are big uh, scenario planning exercises that happen. Um, shakeout actually happens nationally. Arc storm happens in California. But it, it's focused a lot on public sector uh, resources, but I think we might want to think about it. Could we unify those things around extreme events uh, related to the weather or to climate? Um, last point is that a lot of these challenges in risk management, I I've, I've may have emphasized some of the negative side of things too much, but many of these uh, challenges also function as market opportunities. They also identify products or services that we might need in the future, uh, whether it be to be more energy efficient or water efficient or recycle those resources to, to reduce our vulnerability. Um, so there may be some opportunities for your business uh, to expand existing services or products or create new ones. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the last step of the four-step four process. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier that 
you know, the, the Jersey Shore example that the vulnerability has changed, and this really applies to, to many of our vulnerabilities and to our information about climate and climate change. Um, so there's a real need to evaluate and reassess. Um, how to monitor and measure our success in becoming resilient is an area that I think really lacks a strong framework right now. And I think a lot of organizations, both public and private, are experimenting with how do they track their, their success uh, and how do they track being uh, effective uh, at building resilience. Um, that, that definition for resilience that I presented earlier is, is a little squishy. It doesn't lend itself to, uh, to easy quantification. I think one question, though, that, that might be a starter to getting on that, that measurement challenge is, are you prepared for the next climate challenge and or the next big weather event? And I think that's something that people can kind of handle, get a handle on. For example, you know, are people ready for, for the next Sandy or Sandy-like event, uh, whether you be in the Northeast or otherwise? Uh, I think that might be a valuable way to start approaching some of the modern measurement, uh, uh, developing modern measurement processes. Next slide, please. And this is the final slide. Um, so just the takeaway is that you know, climate change is real. It's happening. and it presents a number of challenges to businesses. I think everybody on the call, this is probably a no-brainer. Um, the risk management approach that I outlined helps kind of invert the problem uh, from a, a top-down issue to, I think, a bottom-up one, and, and can often be more effective than inaction uh, in terms of, of how much things will cost. Um, Leveraging available resources and including stakeholders uh, is definitely a best practice. And I think there's not enough resources to go around for everybody to be doing this on their own. Uh, and the last point, which is one I made in the previous slide, that the knowledge base for measuring and tracking resilience is currently thin, uh, but I think it is, it is growing. And with that, I'll close out. I think we have about 10, uh, 10 minutes left to, uh, to do questions. Uh, and I'm happy to answer anything that, uh, that may have come up. So thank you so much. You covered a lot of material in a very condensed amount of time. So I appreciate the I appreciate your your presentation today, and I think you gave a great overview of some of the impacts that we're already seeing from climate change, those that have already been observed, as well as what's projected um, moving forward in terms of impacts and risks, as well, and also a framework for thinking about those implications to the organization or to a business, um, and what steps or options are available. Um, for for entities to take to get to get a better handle on what these risks mean for them and, and what they can do about it. Um, we do have a couple of questions already in queue that I'll ask. Um, if you want to ask a question in our remaining 10 minutes or so of time here, please just type it into the questions uh, dialog box and I will um, moderate those questions as they come in. Uh, so Joe, the first couple of questions actually have to do with um, some of the data and information that you presented in the second part of your talk about climate impacts. Um, so one cropped up around slide 13, um, and while I'm, I'll, I'll ask the question, and while I'm, and while you're thinking about it, I can try to get us back to that slide. But the question is, there was a pause in temperature increase, and how close are we? to having a full explanation for what is happening, and what is the expectation for when we might begin to see growth in temperatures resume? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. That's something that I think the, the new IPCC report will, will probably comment on. Um, I think the important thing to separate is that the, the slowdown, the last 10 or 15 years, we haven't seen the, the rate of warming globally that we've seen in the previous 30 or 40 years. The fact that that, actually, if you go back a couple more slides, I think it might be easier to see. Uh, one more. With the red and the blue bars. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe it's a couple more before that. I just wanted to take a look at the uh, temperature record. That one. Thank you. So you can see that we've kind of, you know, if you look stare at it closely enough, that the last 10 or 15 years hasn't been as steep an increase as, as the previous years. But I think the important thing is to segregate the time scales that a lack of warming or dramatic warming in a 10 or 15 year period shouldn't really uh, change some of the underlying five points that we've seen and the century scale warming. Because as you can see, even within that century scale warming, we've had a lot of ups and downs. And I heard the analogy actually um, when oh, we were at our event in New York that using the last 10 or 15 years to really come to conclusions about what the next 30 to 50 years might look like 
uh, is like making a, a gamble, uh, uh, you know, let's say a 30 or 50 year retirement investment strategy gamble on the stock market based on last week's stock market returns. The, the two time scales have totally different factors that affect it. Um, so I think that's important to keep that separation. Now that being said, trying to explain why things have slowed down is still important as a climate science um, exercise, as understanding the processes that affect the climate. And I think the explanation is a mix of things, and I think we'll see the literature battle it out a little bit, but um, there I think are three not mutually exclusive contenders. Uh, one is just that the Pacific Ocean has been kind of chilly for the last 10 or 15 years. We haven't had a big El Nino event since you can kind of see this bar that sticks up, uh, 1998. Uh, we haven't had a big El Nino event since then. And big El Ninos tend to be very warm. La Ninas tend to be cold, globally speaking. We've had six La Nina years in the last 10. So just kind of by roll of the dice, we, uh, we haven't had uh, a lot of uh, warm things that would make for a warm year. Uh, another issue is, or I should say, in conjunction with that, we have seen a steady increase in other indicators related to temperature. This is atmospheric temperature, but temperature in the ocean uh, have been going up steadily, especially temperatures in the deep ocean. So the idea that the Earth system has somehow stopped warming, I think, is an incorrect conclusion. The third one is, and this one I'm more dubious about than the other two, the other two kind of go together quite well, is what are the role of smaller volcanic eruptions. We haven't had too many huge eruptions since the early 90s, uh, but there have been smaller ones in the tropics, and there's a suggestion that that may have cut into our warming somewhat. So I think the combination of those uh, may provide explanation, but I think the overriding thing is that this, this time scale separation, that what happens on 10 or 15 year time scales, it's hard to really conclude much on the long time scale. For the next 10 or 15 years, I have to say, trying to predict climate on the one year or the 10 year time scale is not something we've been good at in the past and we will continue to be bad at because it really does tie into our ability to understand things like El Nino and La Nina. So in other words, let's go back to the stock market analogy, our ability to figure out what happens in the stock market on a week or two. Um, we are still working, I think, on the observations and the models and the types of things that you need to do those types of predictions, but they're, they're very low skill, and I think they'll remain that way. Uh, but again, to keep in mind that the, the physics associated with that, that type of variability uh, averages out over a long period of time, over the 50 and 100 year period of time. So our expectation for the long future shouldn't be uh, necessarily uh, under, under, uh, undermined by, uh, by that uh, warming hiatus. Joe, thanks very much. <clears throat> Our next question uh, cropped up, I believe, around your uh, slide 18 that dealt with uh, wild data on wildfires impacts. And the mm -hmm. question is, has there been analysis to determine how much of that wildfire increase is due to anti-burning for different forest management practices versus how much is due to uh, global warming? I believe that study, since it was just a sensitivity picture, um, it, it was just kind of a, a model where you, um, you know, just turn up the temperature and, and see what happens. So I think it kind of assumes that the management practices baked into the system are, are kind of there. But there's definitely been a big difference. You know, for, for many decades, we uh, stamped out any fire that uh, occurred. And in doing so, may have uh, actually stopped smaller fires from scouring out a lot of fuels. Um, so I, I'm not sure if the management perspectives can be, or I should say management practices can be changed so much to undercut some of these numbers, uh, but I know that there, there is kind of a, a change in thinking in the last 10 years of, of how to, to that the, there can be some small safe fires that can be burned. Great, thank you. And um, another question, sort of high level, um, about the IPCC uh, assessments that have been done. The question is, um, in your opinion, how might some of the findings from the fifth IPCC assessment that may be a little bit more tempered um, from the relative to the findings in the fourth IPCC assessment uh, with respect to impacts, do you think that might limit um, resilience planning or, or calls for action around investing in resilience? Um, it's for, you know, sort of the differences between the fourth and the fifth assessments. 
Well, I would say that I think the the uh, opponents of climate action will absolutely be trying to spin that story. Um, when you go back and actually look at the, the text of the, and we have a thing on our website about this that looks at the statements from the, the last four assessments, um, you really just see growing confidence uh, coming out of, of you know, the conclusions about those big five points. And I really don't see much tempering of those. I mean, that's, that would be basically cutting against decades of research. Um, there may be some small detail things when you get into, you know, what is our best estimate of equilibrium climate sensitivity? And, um, that I think, again, are these, these secondary points about, uh, about how we think the system works, uh, what our general understanding of what has been going on and where we're going for the future hasn't changed. Um, the second issue, I think, and, and this is, again, I think important to keep in mind if you, if you do see, I think, indictments of the IPCC or statements that the IPCC said climate change isn't a big deal, uh, which I would, I would strongly contend. Um, one of the primary uncertainties about the future for long term, thinking about 2100, is our emissions. And you can get into arguments about what the equilibrium climate sensitivity is or maybe what the recent warming is. But the fact of the matter is we may be doing a lot more than doubling or tripling the CO2. We, may, we are on track to go to really high um, concentrations. And with that, the, the uncertainty in, in how much is associated with doubling, perhaps, or how much warming we've seen over a short period of time, in my, my mind, become quite secondary. That really the primary thing is you know, how, how far, how fast are we taking this uh, taking the trajectory, I should say, how, how large is the ultimate trajectory in emissions going to be? When are we going to turn the corner? Um, and that becomes the primary issue in understanding future climate change, not kind of what is our, our best understanding of the physics. So I think, I think given the magnitude of, of our potential emissions futures, it, it seems to, uh, to me, that's the primary question out there, not, not do we understand the system very well. Okay. Well, Joe, thanks very much. I think we've bumped up against our time allotted for, uh, for today, and I want to thank you, and thanks to everyone uh, who called in today. Um, we do have additional webinars in this series around resilience planning and, and strategies um, across the next few months. You can register for those on C2ES website. Um, thanks very much, and have a good day.